So Apple just bought my time for one year. And that's where I realized that I could actually take this coaching and really help. This is when Steve Jobs came back from being away okay. to Apple. That's when the iPhone team was going. And I had the opportunity to work with that early team. And uh, I wasn't really coaching at the time, Travis. It was more consulting. But I got into having one-on-ones with the team members and and all of a sudden, people said, would you work with me? Would you, would you give me some help one-on-one? And they needed help one-on-one. It wasn't just team stuff. It was like leadership stuff. And so my first company, Executive Edge of Silicon Valley, was started on early work at Apple and Nike. And mm-hmm. that's what evolved. And, and then I realized that I wanted to bring practices of good leadership to startups because I felt like if I could get there early, early intervention, just help them with skills early as they formed their companies, they would build stronger companies. Uh, and so Edward came into the scene and it was, I don't know, I, I look back at the time I met Edward and it was like, we sort of knew Travis right then and there, this was gonna be a match that was gonna make a difference. So he brought this cutting edge kind of startup mentality with a lot of the skills that we already had in coaching, And we just started coaching really top level people, senior people at the cutting edge organizations. So that's kind of the story. I I read a, I read a book recently called trillion dollar coach uh, about Mm -hmm. Bill Campbell was in in your workings at Apple. Was that somebody that you um, kind of had a relationship with? Oh yeah. He was, he was always around. (laughs) So, and uh, he did not coach exactly like we coach uh, Travis more around just really making change with leaders, getting business results, moving to IPO in some cases. He was an advisor, gave a lot of advice to people and did it in a really good way. He was a little more of a mentor than a coach. Yeah, Uh, Just savvy, very savvy with, and Steve Jobs used him. Others used him as well. It's remarkable too, that you guys work with companies that are, that range from startups to, you know, Nike that's been around for decades, because I would have to imagine those conversations are vastly different in terms of calendar management and what you can do when you're in a startup and you have 12 employees versus you are running a fortune 10 company with thousands of employees. Um, so, so I, I, I have a, a software startup, um, yeah. called, called yeah. Guestio. It's like a marketplace that connects, um, content hosts and expert guests for their shows. And at, at the at first, like the first, you know, year and a half, I was just doing everything. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you, you, like you take this hat off and you put on this hat, you take this hat off and put on this hat and you, <laughs> you, you do everything, do everything. And, you know, mm-hmm. I had, I had my, my assistant and she basically, I did everything and then she did everything else. You know what I mean? That, that I didn't do. <laughs> Um, yeah. and, and then at some point, at some point it gets to the point where, where you can start spending more of your week in the strategy seat. Right. Mm-hmm. Cause like what, what my kind of question is now is like, now that we like, we're, we're, we're having growth, we're having, you know, so far this year, about 40% month over month, um, growth in, in revenue for the business. And I often wonder where I should be spending a lot of my time because I really enjoy the strategy part. But also, I know that I can't be existing in 12 months from now because I also know that I don't have everything set up completely in an operational, from an operational standpoint for it to be working on a day-to-day. So I have to be in the day-to-day, but I know that my yep. best strategic value to the company is in long-term 12 months out, 18 months out. Where mm-hmm. should that target be as like a CEO or as an executive? How, how, how do you start like thinking about uh, uh, spending your time in terms of day-to-day versus long-term strategy? Yeah, I'll that's take a good this one, one for you, yeah. Edward. Yeah, yeah. That's a good one for you. Yes. Um, you know, as you're making the transition out of chief do everything officer <laughs> into like a proper CEO, which it sounds like you were very much chief do everything officer, and now you're in the middle of that transition. Um, a lot of uh, CEOs experience it's difficult to let go, right? It's difficult to let go of being really close to the work, close to the transactions, close to the customer. If you're building a product, sometimes the CEO feels like I am the product right? Mm -hmm. My vision, this is my baby. I can't divorce myself, but that becomes the the greatest bottleneck to scaling of a company when the CEO holds on too much. And then the next bottleneck is when the C-suite is holding on too much. Mm -hmm. When you've got 200 employees and five people are making all of the decisions, right? So as quickly as possible, we work with our clients to push important strategic decisions down into the organization Mm -hmm. so that ultimately a high functioning you know, stage two CEO is focusing on cash in the business, 
Do we have enough cash to keep the doors open? Talent, right? Are we recruiting and setting the right cultural framework to um, inspire people to be creative? And vision, where are we going, yeah. right? So where you're at right now, this in-between stage, you're doing a lot of what we call zooming in and zooming out, yeah, right? Yeah, totally. And you're kind of like, you're flying at like this 35,000 feet and you're like, oh, wait, hold on. I see something that is not matching my lens for quality. And you zoom in, you work with that person. Hopefully you do some coaching with that person instead of just marching in and telling them what to do, mm -hmm. right? We want that conversation to be developmental. So they leave having learned something instead of they leave the conversation with the task being done well. Sure. Right. Yeah. Teaching, you're, you're coaching them on becoming a better decision maker themselves. Coaching them on becoming a better decision maker. Yeah. yeah. We talk about in the book, you know, using, taking your lenses off and putting them on other people. Hmm. You know, you want other people to see through the lens of quality or the lens for the business that you have. That's how you achieve real scale as a, as a CEO. So at the threat of turning this into just like a personal coaching session for me. <laughs> right. We love um, it. Let's go. <laughs> Let's do it, Travis. <laughs> this often happens. When we do interviews, yeah. they'll say, can we get some personal coaching? Right? <laughs> so, yeah, it's so, funny. So, so right now, I'll give, kind of give you bird's eye view. And I, I, I honestly think this is super helpful for a lot of people listening um, as yeah. well. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're at the point right now where like my, my assistant has become my chief of staff slash operational manager. She basically make sure the business runs. And then I moved more into generating sales, driving revenue, mm -hmm. business development. We just hired our first couple of sales reps to start bringing sales away off of my plate. Um, and then she's kind of in the operational role. My, my question uh, becomes at some point, like, how do you know you're ready for like your first kind of C-suite hire, like an actual, like a six figure salary type hire with maybe a little bit of equity um, and things like that versus bringing in an, uh, bringing in somebody at, at a junior level and training them up to a certain, you know, like I, I always struggle with, with it's a big, it's a big bullet to bite at some point to, to bring somebody on who essentially I'm paying more than I'm even willing to pay myself at the moment as a startup founder and CEO, um, because they have more experience. At, at what point should you really start considering bringing in that person? Cause from my perspective at this point, it seems like, an operator that's a true operator would be extremely helpful for me so that I can pull myself completely out of day-to-day -day and give it to somebody that I know is extremely competent at building that. Yeah. And that could be for either either, either of you. Yeah. <laughs> Back to you, John. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that first hire like that is such a great question. We get this, Travis, all the time. I really appreciate you going there with this. We often work with uh, companies that are sitting on, I don't know whether you've gotten any seed funding and where your funding is, but when you get those millions of dollars, there's an expectation by the investors that you will begin hiring people. And I don't know what, where that pivot point is around that. I do know that people often wait too long to hire. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure where you are in your product life cycle. Sometimes you can get the right skill sets that you need without hiring a C-suite person. So it may be that I don't know where the product market fit is and you can get good people at you know better dollar amounts. But when you scale and you get money and you grow and you're now 30 to 50 people, then it's time to start thinking about hiring that individual that will really scale the organization. And that's a whole question around fit of C-suite people that are experienced mm -hmm. from the apples of the world into the startup world and how they fit the culture. But um, I don't know. I, I would want to look at product and market fit and where you are and customers and make that decision and cash and do the right financial analysis to decide before you actually jump into a person. But I will tell you that people often will say, I waited too long yeah. to hire the operator. Mm -hmm. I waited too long. I don't know, Edward, what your thoughts about that are, but it's yeah. interesting. I, mean, yeah. I, I, I see a lot of um, solo founders wanting to kind of hire a lot of junior people, as you said. And mm -hmm. what that, what ends up happening is they find that just makes them busier sure. because then they just have more, more heads to manage as opposed to hiring a peer and then getting that leadership leverage. And then suddenly you've widened the whole base of the business, right? Mm -hmm. You've created this, <clears throat> well, one, you have someone to um, kick ideas around with. You got someone to hold you accountable, right? Mm -hmm. um, you have, really a partner in the business. I was running a, 
a, a solo um, coaching firm in New York, and it was going fairly well. And as soon as John and I started working together, it was just like off to the races yeah. for both of us. You know, it just really grew so much faster because we could hold each other accountable. We could, you know, share ideas and share the responsibility of leading the business. 